Good morning and welcome to The Daily Race. So glad that you're here today as we are uh, taking just another step forward, just continuing our journey and our relationship with God and our relationship with others, uh, finding out what our next steps are as we uh, not just study God's word for information, but for transformation. And today is, is an important point in, in the, the history of Israel here. You see up to this point, uh, Israel has been led by prophets and by judges, uh, by the, the high priest. And essentially what that means is that God has been their leader. God speaks through the prophets. God <coughs> works through the high priesthood. Uh, God raises up judges uh, to, to rule over people, to be point people. Um, these aren't hereditary things. Uh, we see that different judges come up at, at different times. The whole book of Joshua and Judges is, is full of those accounts. Uh, but today, the people come to the point where they're asking for a king. In fact, it says, uh, we're in 1 Samuel chapter 8. It says this, As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba. But they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you're old now, and your sons aren't like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations. Samuel was displeased with the request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them out of Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. And now they're giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way the king will reign over them. So Samuel goes to them and, and lets them know, hey, this is what it means to have a king. To have a king means that there's going to be taxes. There's going to be a standing army. There's going to be all types of, of people whose sole job is to support that lifestyle of the king. Servants and guards and chariot drivers and, and all of this. Is this really what you want? And the people say, yes. This is what we want. Now, the important part here to, to realize is that the answer that, that God gives Samuel is like, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. Which in the moment, Samuel, it could feel very much like they're rejecting Samuel. They're like, hey, your, your boys, they're, they're not doing it right. Like, they're, they're not going to be good rulers like you, Samuel. So, so we need to just stop this whole system and start a new one. We don't want to be under their rule. We don't want them to be the next leaders. And what they were doing is they were being short-sighted. Now, were Samuel's people, uh, uh, kids uh, not greedy, full of uh, pride and, and, and wanting, you know, being after money? Yes, and that's very clear there. Yet, they were part of God's plan to rule over them, to, to be uh, the high priest, to, to work through, through the prophets. And God reminds them, hey, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. They're rejecting the process. They're rejecting who is, is ultimately in control, and they want a person that they can look to. Um, they're going to have to deal with the consequences of that. Now let's, let's back this up a little bit and let's, let's look at it from a higher view. Now, what's the big principle that we're, we're looking at here? It, so often we take personal offense when people uh, don't want to have anything to do with, with uh, our, our faith, with our, our values, with uh, what we, the, the, uh, the way of living that the Bible lays out for for us. What's white, what's wrong, how we live our lives, what we stand up for truth, all those types of things. And we begin to conflict with people. I know we do. I see it on Facebook. It comes up all the time, right? And so often we take that personally. We feel like it's our personal vendetta to, to, to fight against these certain things. And I'm not talking about big general, you know, uh, Facebook probably brought it into like this big general, but I'm talking about the personal relationships, those friends, those family members, those coworkers who we have disagreements with uh, on matters of faith. And it's, it's hard to not feel personal because when someone is saying no to the, the values and the beliefs that we have, it feels like they're saying no to us. But what they're actually saying no to is God. That, that hey, we're, they're not rejecting you, that we're not rejecting me, they're rejecting God. Now this probably doesn't feel that much different in the moment, right? No is still no. Pushing away is still pushing away. Seeing people make 
poor decisions, bad decisions, which we know are going to cause hurt and pain and no matter how much we, we try to warn them, no matter how much we try to to, to say you, the path that you're headed is headed towards the destruction and it's going to cause hurt and pain in your life, to still let them go. Because they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting God. And maybe God is going to use that to teach them a lesson. Maybe God's going to use that to bring them to themselves. As we look at this uh, time period in Israel, it's not like things are perfect. It's not like with the, the prophets and with the high priests, they're just, they have a spotless record. No, they're still worshiping false gods. There's still Asherah poles being constructed. There's still Israelites that are worshiping Baal. Maybe, maybe even with their rejection of God's way, maybe God might do something through the kings to bring them, even though that's his preferred plan is to, to lead them directly. God can still use other means to bring them to himself because it's God's battle, not ours. Doesn't mean we just throw up our hands. Doesn't mean we don't have tough conversations. Doesn't mean we don't warn people. And it doesn't mean that we don't point people towards truth, but we do it in a way that's not personal rejection. We're laying out, we're recognizing that it's God that's at work. And God is the one that's responsible for the results, not us. He uses people. He's going to use your words. He's certainly going to use your example. He's going to use your actions. But it's God that is moving his plan forward, not us. So it's not a delegation of responsibilities like, oh, well, it's just God. I don't have to do anything. No, 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 no. God still called you to, to love him, to obey him, and to, to speak truth and love, all these things. But he's the one that's responsible for the results. Because at the end, ultimately, it's not people rejecting or accepting us. It's God himself. Let's pray. God, we come to you today, and we are so grateful that we get to, to work with you on your redemption plan, that you've asked us, you've called us to, to play a small role, to speak when you want us to speak, to, to live lives of integrity and truth, to point people towards you with our actions and our attitudes. But God, we, we recognize here today the, the role that we play in this, God. It's, it's a minor role. It's a supporting role. We're... We're, we're background actors. You are the star. It's your story. You're in control. And God, help us to remember that as we step into today. We step into today as a supporting actor in the greatest story ever told. And what a privilege that is. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, hey, I hope you have a great, great rest of the day. I look forward to seeing you 24 hours from now right back here on The Daily Race. Love you guys.